Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored this evening to introduce two internationally best-selling writers and intellectuals to the Free Library. Siri Hustvet is the author of a book of poems, four collections of essays, six novels, and a work of nonfiction, The Shaking Woman, or A History of My Nerves. Her most recent collection of essays, a Woman Looking at Men, Looking at Women includes a 200-page essay on the mind-body problem, The Delusions of Certainty. In 2012, she was awarded the International Gaboron Prize for Thought and Humanities. Her most recent novel, The Blazing World, was long-listed for the Man Booker Prize and won the Los Angeles Book Prize for Fiction, 2014. She has a PhD in English from Columbia University and is a lecturer in psychiatry at the DeWitt Wallace Institute for the History of Psychiatry at Weill Medical College of Cornell University. Her work has been translated into over 30 languages. In a 2010 TED Talk, Alif Shafak discussed how stories can punch holes in our mental walls, forming human connections, crossing divides. She is passionately interested in dissolving barriers, whether of race, nationality, culture, gender, geography, or a more mystical kind. Her 15 books include the best-selling novels, The Bastard of Istanbul, The 40 Rules of Love, and The Architect's Apprentice. She has published scores of articles in Turkish and English for periodicals around the world. Her writing has been nominated for the Orange Prize and the Impact Dublin Award and she was awarded the honorary distinction of Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters in 2010. Three Daughters of Eve, her 10th novel, slides between Istanbul and Oxford and explores faith and doubt and how our personal attitudes to God can shape our often rigid concept of who we are. Please welcome Siri Hustvet and Alif Shafak to the Free Library. So. We're going to wing this conversation, and I tell you why, because we like each other. Yes. <laughs> and um, we like each other for, I think, a number of significant reasons that are connected to the work that we do. And we were going to begin, Alif, with the idea of writing fiction as uh, a way into other lives, mm -hmm. uh, becoming others, I like to call it, mm -hmm. and that there is a prejudice in the culture at the moment um, about nonfiction as opposed to fiction. Have you noticed this? That nonfiction, which I also write, and, and Alif has written and uh, also done, so we have two hats, is considered to be the real, hard, masculine stuff, right? Yeah. And fiction is the fluffy, femi, imaginary stuff. And I think that this is a false dichotomy, right? Mm -hmm. That um, fiction uh, is something that we all do, that it's rooted in the human animal, that we, all of us, are uh, creatures who can remember ourselves in the past and cast ourselves into an imaginary future. And that a great deal of nonfiction, of course, is using the mechanisms of memory and imagination. Absolutely. Well, I have to tell how happy I am to, to share the same stage with Siri. And I have so much respect for you, for your mind, for your work. What is fascinating for me to see is we come from different backgrounds. We have lived in different countries. And yet how similar things can be. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to attitudes towards fiction and nonfiction, and exactly as you said, we think we learn things from nonfiction, but we just, you know, uh, fiction is for entertainment. You know, that's that's something else, not for nourishment of the mind. 
where does this distinction come from? I have met so many um, people in Turkey and people in influential positions, like male journalists, columnists, uh, academics, telling me they don't read fiction. And yeah. they say it proudly, you know? Mm -hmm. They don't see any problem in this. <laughs> yeah. um, and they say, I read serious books. I read yeah. history, philosophy, but not fiction. Also, I noticed, and I don't know if this would be um, similar here, so I'm curious to hear yeah. your thoughts. Yeah. There is a distinction between the novel as a genre um, and poetry in mm. Turkey, because poetry, and we have this long tradition of poetry yes. that goes all the way back great, to the Ottoman great Empire. Poetry. Great yeah. poetry. Yeah. But poetry is supposed to be more emotional, connected with emotions. Yeah. Whereas, because the novel was came to us from Europe, from continental Europe, late Ottoman century, it was the vehicle of modernization. We associated with the cerebral mind at some level. Uh -huh. So again, if a novelist, male novelist writes a novel, it is perceived differently. Yes. When a woman novelist writes a novel, it's perceived differently. Yes. And I think women are not respected, to put it very bluntly, until they get old in the eyes of the society. <laughs> That's but, right. Yeah. Old helps. And old, I'm the old, old one on this stage, not the, this younger person over here. So, uh, no, it's true. And no, I have my favorite line. And this happens to me all over the world. And I mean, well, all over the United States and in uh, Western Europe, which is mostly where I travel for mm -hmm. my books. And um, people stand in line and you sign. And, and, there'll be a man and he says, I don't read fiction, but my wife does. Would you sign the book to her? <laughs> and I always think, where is the wife? Yeah. I mean, why did you come and stand in line you know, yeah. to, to have the book signed? Now, now, there's a deep thing in here, which is very interesting. And I think it has to do mm -hmm. with not wanting to give yourself up to the authority of a woman, mm -hmm. quite literally, mm -hmm. right? So that we're dealing with power structures, many of them completely unconscious. Mm -hmm. I mean, the poor man who stood in line, whether I believe him or not, did he stand in line for himself and he's just too embarrassed? Or mm -hmm. is he really waiting for his wife, who I don't know where she is. She's yeah. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that you give yourself up because reading is intimate and reading novels is deeply intimate, right? Mm -hmm. You are, you take on the internal narrator of another human being mm -hmm. and no one can have both at the same time. You notice this, right? You can't have two discourses going on in your head. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. You have one or mm -hmm. the, the book. There's a uh, Georges Poulet, a, a, a French theorist, talked about reading as a form of possession mm -hmm. by the other. And in novels, where they're very often about subjective states, mm -hmm. that intimacy has a certain danger. Mm -hmm. And you have to, as I like to say, art is like sex. If you don't relax, you won't enjoy it. It's funny, but think about it. You know, if all your defenses are up, you can't, of course, yeah. you can't really yes. read. It's also fascinating that most fiction readers, again, wherever you go, happen to be women. And particularly in countries like Turkey, but I, I observe this elsewhere as well, women, you know, women readers, they do not only take a book, read it, enjoy it, and then put it on the shelf, they pass it on. Yes. They share it, you know. Yes. They send it to their um, to their, their aunt, and the aunt yes. reads it, and then she sends it to her niece. <laughs> so the same copy can travel yes. five or six people on average. Really, that's my observation. Yes. The same copy is read by five to six people, underlining different sentences by using different colored pens. And I have met, uh, again, you know, when we talk about the book signing cues, some male readers coming in saying, I wasn't going to read you, but my wife or my girlfriend kept talking so insisted, much. Insisted, yeah. Insisted <laughs> that I had to. You know, it's like a surrender. So, in a way, I think we owe so much to, to women readers because they, that word of mouth, I think it's, it's incredibly important. But then it's very paradoxical that the written culture itself is so male-dominated, still male-dominated, especially as you move up the ladder. 
And this is one thing that is universal, the way our work is reviewed, criticized, seen by critics uh, in newspapers, publications, still there's a major gender gap there. Yeah, yeah. No, and I mean, sometimes these things, you know, I think as you get older too, you start to get a kind of a sense of humor about this. <laughs> and, um, and I know that when I, I have this other life now lecturing in uh, neuroscience, neurology, psychiatry, these somewhat related fields and philosophy, and when I do that, about 80% of my audiences are male. And when I do yeah, uh, a reading or a conversation about fiction, it's usually just exactly the reverse. <laughs> so what's fascinating about that is that we attribute sex mm -hmm. to aspects of the human world that have, of course, no sex. Yeah. I mean, uh, mathematics is not a, a sexual being. <laughs> it's, a, it's a discipline. Poetry. Yeah. which is connected. So in the West, we've al always made this distinction between nature and the body as sure. feminine and uh, the intellect and culture as, as masculine. masculine. And this is way back rooted in the, in, in the Greeks and has gone on ever since. And I think similarly, when um, you know, we share our fiction, there's this assumption that it has to be autobiographical. If, if a woman has written it, then the story must be her story. Uh, and I, I see that prejudice a lot, and, and it bothers me. Uh, it can be autobiographical, and, and, it, and, and it can be the opposite as well. There are so many ways of writing fiction, not just one no. formula. No. It bothers me, this, you know, especially in creative writing courses, write what you know. This emphasis right. on autobiographical work, that's not how I began when I look at my own journey. Um, I thought my own life was very boring, to be honest, and there was nothing interesting to write about myself. What was much more interesting was to be someone else yes. and then someone else. And it's almost like a transcendental journey. Uh, and, and the more you do it, the more you become used to doing this. Empathy, I think, is like a muscle. Yes. You know, the more you use it. So um, it. it it bothers me slightly that when we share our fiction immediately, we were just talking about this on the way here, they associate the writer, women writer, with the women character in the yes. book, but maybe that's not Even if not you have you a male all. narrator, in my case, you know, the whole book is this man telling a story, and then they say, but you're really Violet, and I was, you know, I've written two books from, uh, with yeah, a male narr yeah, narrator, yeah. And, and people are always, yeah. whereas actually, I'm much closer to the male narrator, yeah. I would say, autobiographically or emotionally, yeah. than I am to the female characters. Also, the beauty of it is you can be multiple. You yes. can be male, female, you can be beyond that. I mean, in so-called real life, we are so reduced to one self, one identity. And the beauty of fiction is that freedom that you experience. You meet the multiplicity within. Yes, in fact, in this book of essays that um, I think I'm here for, a woman looking at men looking at women, one of the things I say in a long essay about the mind-body problem is you know, the phenomenon that used to be called multiple uh, personality disorder, mm -hmm. which is now called dissociative identity disorder because, you know, there was an epidemic, if you remember. And to ask questions about mm -hmm. that, what is the relationship between um, people who dissociate into several personalities mm -hmm. and the novelist? It's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I think there's a significant and important difference, which is that um, we know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I know when I know they're my characters. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but, but nevertheless, I, I would, I think there are certain qu people who actually have this disorder can show different physiological signs, mm -hmm. so that one personality. Uh, has asthma and another doesn't, for example. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, no one has ever asked the question, but if novelists work on a book for a long time with, say, a narrator mm -hmm. or several narrators that are very different from you 
much older, much younger, et cetera, et cetera, if the novelist doesn't, in fact, begin to show different physiological, mm -hmm. um, uh, that you could probably quantify it, although yeah. it would be hard to set up the experiment. Yes, but it would be a fascinating <laughs> subject. It's a great subject, It's though. a great subject, for yeah. sure. But I think at the heart of it is the way we perceive life um, as water, made of water. You know, gender is fluid, identities are fluid, and it's all about connections, uh, like Umberto Eco wrote uh, in the past. And those connections exist. We do not have to invent the connections, but you just have to um, think about them. You just have to put a light on them. And to me, that's fascinating. It's like all these characters, how their stories touch each other, how their destinies t touch each other, this interconnectivity. Yes. Nobody is isolated, nothing is isolated, and nothing is black and white. Yes. Um, again, when I think about this my... This is why I like this woman so much. <laughs> so anyway, keep going. But it took me a while, I think, to understand. Maybe my own upbringing had an impact on this because I, I was raised by a single mother, and I grew up without seeing my father. Oh. And I discovered over the years that he was a very good father to his two sons, ah. which was very difficult for me to digest because I had this image of my father as being a very, you know, bad man. And if he had been a bad person, it would have made sense why he hadn't got in touch with me. Of course. You know what I mean? And then it took me a long time to realize Okay, this is a man who was a good academic, a very good intellectual, a very good thinker, someone with a, with a high IQ, very low emotional IQ. Yeah. So all I'm trying to say is, like many of us, not only my father, we can be good in some areas. There are some other areas in our lives where we fail so badly, some other areas where we are so-so. As a novelist, I think you tap into that complexity. That is why right. there's no black and white. Yes, exactly. Mm. And, um, you know, the, the, some of the thinkers that I've been very interested in have tried or thought about how to formalize mm. this, what you're saying, what I call, I don't call it, I stole this from Martin Buber, the between. Yeah. And, you know, Buber thinks of this space between uh, people as an ontological reality. That is, it is not, um, it is something that is created between people, but it's a third entity. Mm -hmm. And I like that mm -hmm. idea very much. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's true what you're saying, that some people are far more mm -hmm. clued in yeah. or sensitive to, uh, to, to those... You know, way back in the 60s, they used to call it vibrations. You remember that? <laughs> the vibes. Um, and, but, but, and then, of course, in psychoanalysis, they talk about transference mm -hmm. and countertransference. Yeah. And Freud said that transference is, of course, not limited to the psychoanalytic room or the psychoanalytic space. It's something that goes on with mm -hmm. human beings all the time. All the time. And, um, and, and that's a between space, and of course, depending on our emotional stories, mm -hmm. to go back to stories, um, we will respond mm -hmm. to a person in different ways. But that's why we need more novels, we need more fiction, because I think where, where it meets, the, the emotions and the intellect come together. I make a distinction between, um, among information, knowledge and wisdom. You know, information is very yeah. different than knowledge, and knowledge is very different than <coughs> wisdom. Yeah. But we often confuse these things because we live in an age where we have so much information about almost everything, and if we don't have the information, we just Google it, you know? Yeah. And, and that gives us the illusion that we know something about the subject. But knowledge is something completely different. Yes. Um, a very different way of using our minds, whereas wisdom is even more different than knowledge. And for that, you need emotional intelligence and emotional investment absolutely. as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like that, <laughs> wisdom. But, um, oh yeah, we had our, what was our next beat? We want to talk about politics to, uh, towards the oh, end. Oh yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> We're going to do because that. Because maybe it's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little bit inevitable. Uh, I don't know if you'd agree, but I, over the years I, I thought, 
if you come from countries like Turkey, Nigeria, Venezuela, Russia, oh, Philippines, yeah. you know, and if you happen to be a writer, you really don't have the luxury of being apolitical. Um, and you get political questions all the time. Right. You, you feel an urgency to respond to things. I'm not talking about being a partisan. Not, I'm not talking about party politics, not that kind no. of politics. No. But I'm maybe using it in a broader way, um, the way feminism used it, uh, defined it, feminist movements in the past. I like that a lot, respect that a lot. So they have taught us that politics is not only about the parliament and political no. parties, it's also the personal space. Yeah. Now, when you define politics in that broader way, it's, it's impossible to be apolitical. Yes. But still there was this difference between Western authors and non-Western authors. We had to deal with politics maybe more. I think that is changing, that is shifting. <laughs> you know, reason for that. <laughs> so last time I checked. I, yeah. <laughs> I observed that in England as well. I mean, uh, with yes. Brexit, post-Brexit. When I first moved to um, London, about nine years ago now, I used to think, wow, the British are so calm when they talk about politics. And now they're not calm anymore. No. You know? no. Of course, they're not as angry as we are in Turkey, but still, people have become more emotional when they talk about yes. politics. Yes. And that change is universal, almost. Well, and these are, I think, fundamental questions, and they can be related to what we were saying before about the writing of fiction. Yeah. That, you know, entering the, the other, yeah. if you will, right? Yeah. That, so becoming the other is part of the act of fiction, including often uh, characters that are uh, alien, mm -hmm. uh, cold, yeah. uh, emotionally shut down, mm -hmm. uh, sadistic. Uh, usually I avoid those characters as my narrator because mm -hmm. I don't want to live there. Mm -hmm. But they certainly appear mm -hmm. uh, in my work. And so in political life, mm -hmm. this is sort of more of a question, but in political life, I am thinking a lot these days about what that means, mm -hmm. especially in terms of, you know, misogyny yeah. and xenophobia and racism. You know, this is, these are real questions. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's, there are a lot of platitudes in the American press about, you know, understanding, you know, the, these positions, in mm -hmm. a way, of, of reaching out. And, you know, this is a, a nice sentiment. Mm -hmm. But I've often thought about, uh, not that it's a, by any means an exact parallel, but um, let's think about Germans in the 30s who voted for Hitler. And no doubt there were very kind people among those voters. But from a historical perspective, now it would be ridiculous, or you know, no one does it, to go and unearth all the kind stories about Hitler supporters. I hear no, what you're saying. No, but what, well, I guess I'm trying to mm. complicate it enough, mm. Mm. right? Mm. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest you know, on what used to be the prairie. Mm -hmm. uh, and my grandparents were ruined by the Depression, my father's parents. And they had a lot of prejudices. They were on the left, right? But their prejudices were very much the same. City slickers and bankers were the hated people. And in case you don't know, it took me many years to uncover this, but bankers was code for Jew. So under this you know, this, hum, you, know, you know, somewhat homogenous reality mm -hmm. were these deep prejudices that could go both to the left and the right. Absolutely. No, I, I, I really hear what you're saying. My only concern is when we are so polarized. Oh, it's bad. Um, it is really bad. It doesn't help. I mean, Turkey is maybe a prime example of this. And I think in so many ways, Turkey holds important lessons for progressive-minded people all around the world. How did it happen? How did we slide backwards, first gradually, but then with a bewildering speed? 
And what I observe, not only in Turkey, but in Hungary, elsewhere, in Poland, there are, yes. uh, you know. A lot is going yeah, on there. A lot yeah. is going there. But what I observe is, whenever um, half of the society is pitted against the other half, the demagogue benefits from this. Yes. You know, populist yes. leaders benefit from this. This is exactly what they want. They need an us, they need a them. And they need that constant stress, that constant tension. So by continuing to divide into groups, islands, ghettos, are we helping that populist narrative to gain more yes. ground? Uh, I, I think it's healthier to keep criticizing politicians, governments, but connect with the people. We must connect with the civil society, with the people, because I know there's, despite the xenophobia, homophobia, all kinds of prejudices, there's room there for, for change. And, and there are people who have never heard another narrative. Isolating them doesn't yes. help either. No, so those I, are my concerns. No, I, you know? think you, I think this is, you know, this is exactly the place to move, right? Mm -hmm. So I also think that one can have genuine sympathy mm -hmm. for the feelings people have. Mm -hmm. huh? The, the feelings, for example, I think uh, of shame and humiliation that are enormous drivers of nativist populism. That, mm -hmm. I think, in the United States and in Europe, mm -hmm. elsewhere, all around. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And that the, you can have tremendous sympathy for those feelings without adopting any of the politics, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a kind of human way in. So white men uh, who grew up with, you know, they don't even know it, right? It's an unconsciously uh, integrated sense of their superiority. And when the culture changes mm -hmm. and suddenly, you know, women are having jobs mm -hmm. that that only men used to have um, you know there's a you know larger black middle class in this country mm -hmm. all of these things Asians you know Asians are the new Jews as we say in New York right you know all the top level schools have huge numbers of Asian kids because they come from a culture where it's study, 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 yeah. study. And, uh, and all of this then is a shocking and shameful reality, right? It makes the person, you know, the white guy feel humiliated mm -hmm. and less than. Mm -hmm. When in fact, it's just the society is becoming somewhat more equal and the mm -hmm. demographics are changing. Yeah. But we can be sympathetic with those feelings. We all know that shame and humiliation are the worst feelings I in the world. I understand, and in some yeah. ways it reminds me of, um, it's a completely different example, but the increase in domestic violence in, in Turkey, oftentimes it appears, and, and there's a very alarming, very, you know, when you look at the figures, and the figures are just an illusion because the reality is much bigger, but most of the cases of killing of wives by ex-husbands, ex-boyfriends, is when the woman wants to break up and she wants to walk her own way because now she, she can, there's, there's that yes. feeling. So you see those sociological changes and the reaction. I understand that kind of backlash, but would it be, a mis would it be correct to say that all these changes are happening only because of that reason? This is maybe one of the reasons. There are other other reasons. I, I, I honestly think we need to look at the globalization. Oh, of course. Um, you know, the people who were left out. And when we talk about emotions, emotions are incredibly important, but we are also emotional. I mean, liberals are emotional, conservatives are emotional, people on either side of the ideological spectrum. There is anger everywhere. There is anxiety everywhere. And one of the widest, uh, when, when I look at the results, like Pew Research Center of the new generation, there's a lot of anxiety in the new generation as yeah. well. So I don't want to say it's only out of fear or out of anxiety that people have voted a particular way. No. And if I no. may add this, I don't want to say that 
in my opinion, not everyone who voted Brexit is a xenophobe. Or no. not everyone who voted... No, absolutely. And I think this I mean? is so absolutely... I no, it's the yeah. same kind of thing, you know. And so what's fascinating, though, you know, you look at studies. We all, all have to take studies with a grain of salt because they're sure. focused. But I was interested in um, a, a little study I found uh, where they discovered that as much as political party affiliation, mm -hmm. what they call hostile sexism mm -hmm. was a predictor of a vote for Trump. Not benevolent sexism, you know the difference? So benevolent sexism is the guy who is protective of women, right? He wants to, you know, the, 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 the person who feels that you're inferior but nevertheless wants to, to take care of you. It's a much less virulent form, right? You know, it's, 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 it's much easier to take. And, and the other kind is the really angry mm. thing. You know, uh, who does she think she is? Mm -hmm. You know, let's slap her down. The kind of Trump form. And so that was an interesting little tidbit about, um, you know, why, what stirred up, but also income, you know, that there was this idea that Trump voters were, you know, suffering white people out there uh, on the plains. And just as many people voted for uh, Trump who make over $100,000 a year as voted for Hillary Clinton. So there, you know. So again, it's not you can't generalize. No, oh, no, you can't generalize. And 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 again, there's research that shows us anxiety actually is a big motivation there, not necessarily the poorest, but people who fear becoming poorer. Yes. So the yes. fear, the perception, perceptions are so important. And again, when I look at Poland, Poland is majority white. Yes. You know, immigration is not an issue in Poland. No. But in general elections, immigration is a major topic. Um, they don't have too much diversity in the society, but the perception, the fear of losing a culture. So what is real and what is perceived, that, that gap to me is interesting. But also I think we have been observing, all of us together, the fragility of democracy, the fragility. Of, I mean, the things that we took for granted, there was so much optimism in, in you will remember, early 2000s. So many academic articles were written, so many articles in yeah. newspapers. We were all going to become one big global village. <laughs> Nationalism was going to disappear. Yeah. Nation state That's was going right. to lose it. And that didn't happen. Something no. else happened. Absolutely. And this wasn't predicted. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. And, uh, but again, you know, it's important to recognize the degree to which what we think of as the imagination mm -hmm. plays a huge role mm -hmm. in political reality. Right. So it's just what you were saying about mm -hmm. Poland. I was in Poland actually for, at a literary festival about mm -hmm. a month ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are these magazines. I mean, it's, I was shown by a, a young student a magazine with a blonde yeah. woman. It looks like, you know, from the 1930s, you know, her breasts are kind of coming out of her shirt and she's lying back as if she's being raped. And standing around her are these you know, kind of demonic figures, mm -hmm. demonic Muslim figures. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there are hardly any immigrants in Poland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the fantasy is strong. And the symbols are always the same. We think of motherland as a woman yes. in danger, you know, in danger of rape from outsiders. Those metaphors are so old, so universal, that's, to and me that's fascinating. Nationalism, absolutely, the same kind of nationalism. Absolutely, and everywhere. so where do these deep metaphors come from? I think they're often bodily metaphors. Yeah. So if you remember, well, we don't have to remember because it keeps coming up, I never thought it would ever happen. Build a wall. Build a wall. What is this appealing to? I mean, the idea of a wall at the Mexican border is, is it's an absurdity. But it, it drew on these terrors of, I think, crossing the borders of the body. You know, the body politic, the state as a sort of 
Mm -hmm. place with specific borders mm -hmm. that can be violated by disease or impurities of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that, uh, that our president uh, seems to suffer from phobias of, you know, menstrual blood. We know this is menstrual blood, breast milk, uh, you know, fluids, but this, these, are, these are deep uh, metaphors that I think go straight to tremendous anxieties about the body and, and its borders. Well, one thing I wanted to m mention together, because I think this is another subject we have in common, is uh, maybe our appreciation of knowledge. And together with the rise of all these populist movements, what I observe is the romanticization of the Vogue, not only romanticization of the motherland, but of the people, real people. Yes. As if there's also an unreal people somewhere. <laughs> and together with that comes um, a lack of trust in knowledge or, or labeling intellectuals yes. as the elite. Yes, yes, yes. To me, that is, that is very troubling. And of course, there are so many stages. We have to remember the Arab Spring happened not many people predicted the Arab Spring. I mean, at the beginning, everyone thought it was, wow, optimism. It didn't turn out that way. The financial crisis, Euro crisis, yeah. and then Brexit happened, and then the American elections. Over and over, people have seen that experts have failed to predict. Absolutely. Now, in an environment Absolutely. like that, if a populist leader comes and says, you see, you know, don't trust these experts, whatever they are, just trust your gut instincts. This is the discourse I have heard in Great Britain. Yes. You, know, you are the real people. You, ha you are the true people, the true nation. Just trust your gut instinct. You don't need additional knowledge. That I find very scary. Like you don't need intellect anymore. And no. you just follow your gut feelings. <laughs> This is a discourse uh -huh. that I have heard in Turkey no. as well, you know, for in, so many years. Like, it, don't it trust happens, intellectuals yes. because they're westernized. Absolutely. They are the pawns of western powers. Right. Yes. You know that kind of paranoia? Well, anti-intellectualism is very strong in the United States, and it's not new. I mean, it's yeah. an old it's yeah. an old theme, and I, I know we got a signal that we're supposed to get questions really soon, but just um, there is um, a, a Dutch scholar who's done um, a lot of research on nativist populism in Europe, mm -hmm. and he w uh, was asked to weigh in at various moments on, on this, and I can't remember where I read it, but he said every time the right, you know, a sort mm -hmm. of nativist populist leader gains traction in a culture, mm -hmm. the press falls all over itself um, trying to uh, say that, that the people have yeah. been ignored. You know, that the will of the people has been ignored. And he said, the one thing that's really important to remember is that angry white men are not the people. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's like, who are the people? There are no real people. Everybody's the people. Everybody's. Angry white people are part of the, of the people and uh, everybody all else. All We're all us. the people. Yeah. And yeah. intellectuals are the people too. Sure. And so there's something yeah. so false yeah. about designating some, as you yeah. said, it's a romantic idea, yeah. right? Blo you know, blood and soil. Yeah. We, we have to be really careful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. we, we're going to stop here because we would love to hear your <laughs> questions, comments. Yeah. If you don't agree with anything, you know, some of the things we've said, please, yes. please feel free to share. Before we move to questions, we we're having a discussion in back, and we thought it might be interesting to hear a little bit. We mentioned a little bit the content of your book, Siri, but we never got to hear what your latest book is about. Ellie. Of my, yeah. my book. Um, my latest novel is Three Daughters of Eve, and uh, it tells the story in a nutshell of three young women who attend Oxford University. They all take a seminar uh, from an interesting professor who teaches a seminar on God. Um, and these three girls, coincidentally, they meet there. They all come from Muslim backgrounds, but their connection with their identity, religion, faith is completely different. 
So there's Shirin, who is um, the child of exiled parents, British-Iranian. She's very critical of all religions, but in particular of Islam, because of the lack of gender equality. There's Mona, who is Egyptian-American. Um, she is a practicing Muslim, and she complains about Islamophobia, because she experiences this a lot. And there's Piri, the Turkish girl, who has lots of questions about everything and anything. So jokingly, they call themselves the sinner, the believer, and the confused. And the entire book, I believe, mostly focuses on the journey of the confused one and the confusions yeah. of our times. I went to Turkey uh, a few months after er Erdogan was in, and there was this feeling of, uh, well, let's wait and see what happens. When? Uh, which year you were there? It was, I'm not sure, it was about six months after okay, he, okay, okay, he got okay. in. Okay. So recently, was, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah and okay. um, his, his wife wore a headscarf, and, and the, the idea was, well, you know, after all, women, people should decide how they dress. They shouldn't be told, you have to do this, you have to do that, either way. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at other LCC and other people who came in, mm -hmm. um, how do you see mm -hmm. dictators, mm -hmm. well, they turned out to be dictators. Um, you know, why do people put up with, <laughs> with what they put up? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same question, why do yeah. people vote in, yeah. a, in a certain way? I personally don't want anyone in Turkey to be too powerful. Because whoever has too much power craves even more power and then more power and it's not enough. We had the shape of democracy but not really a culture of democracy. Very yeah. briefly, yeah. what I can tell you is the Turkish case shows us the ballot box in itself is not enough to sustain a democracy, because we had the ballot box, you know. It's, they have been in power for, for almost 14 years, and it increasingly, increasingly became more enclosed, isolated, and authoritarian. It didn't happen in one night. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the important lesson, I think, for all of us when we look at Turkey is if we don't have rule of law, if there is no separation of powers, it's incredibly important, independent academia, very important, the free media, free diverse media, freedom yeah. of speech, women's rights, LGBT rights, minority rights, together with all these things and the healthy civil society, <laughs> then you can have a democracy. Even then it's not easy, but then you have a democracy. We have none of those. We just have a ballot box. And as a result, what we ended up with was majoritarianism. Yeah. And from majoritarianism, it was really a very short step to authoritarianism. And that's where we ended up right now. I have a question. I have a number of writer friends, Turkish writer friends, who are no longer writing, mm -hmm. who have left the country, yeah. um, who are imprisoned. And I want to know about you, because I know you've lived, you were born in Europe, but you're Turkish. You've spent a lot of time in your native country, um, Turkey. Um, and are you safe? Can you travel back and forth, and can your children and your family, do you feel you have to be on the West to write about the country that you love? No, I don't, I don't want to um, <laughs> give you a very general answer, but who is safe in this world? You know, Look at the world we're living in, very liquid times. But on the other hand, as a writer, how I feel, I feel... Uh, very divided, very torn, because on the one hand, I feel very attached to the culture, the people. Uh, so there's a big emotional uh, hurt there, or connection, if you will. Uh, but on the other hand, when I look at the politics, politicians, I feel very depressed. And I wouldn't believe any writer who says, coming from Turkey, I'm free to write whatever I want, because that is not true. I think there's widespread self-censorship. And every Turkish writer, poet, academic journalist knows that because of something you say, you can be easily called a traitor, you know, demonized in pro-government papers, almost lynched on social media, and then put on trial. It can happen just in one night. So um, we have to live with that feeling. Um, but to be honest, I think it's much more d difficult for journalists. It's difficult for all literati, but for journalism has yeah. become the most difficult profession in Turkey. Yeah. 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 And proper journalism yeah. is so important. I mean, yeah. it, it makes me sad to see in this country as well, the media being under attack all the time. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's uh, you know part of a movement towards a more author authoritarian state. Yeah. The first thing yeah, is the media. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, We don't have journalists in jail yet, but we have to. Siri, do you feel like you can write whatever you want? Yeah, I think so. But I, I think what's really interesting is that in some uh, parts of American culture, we, there is a certain form of self-censorship. Um, and, uh, and I think if we believe that the imagination is becoming others, uh, that yeah. we can take on questions. I remember I had, in a couple of my books, I've had black characters and, um, and addressed that slavery is part of, you know, one of the thematics of, of the books, and no one asks you. Mm -hmm. No interviewer asks you about, mostly, of course, they're white, mm -hmm. and there's a kind of just repression of the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. subject. So that's interesting. That's not that I couldn't write it, but, but rather that you feel there's a certain self-censorship in American yeah. culture. But interestingly, what I observe is, again, in countries like Turkey, where you don't have proper freedom of speech, maybe books or words matter more. I agree. Or they stay longer Absolutely. with people. And, and why is it like that? So that's yeah. very interesting. I mean, in this country, so many books are being published, yes. but also words evaporate too fast. Yes. You know? Yes. Whereas for us, um, somehow, they stay with the readers, and, and maybe their impact in that regard. For the former Soviet Union. Yeah. You know, for example, books being smuggled in. Yeah. Uh, important books that then, you know, they bloomed at least in some important circles. Yeah. And uh, that changed. Uh, also humor. I think yeah. humor is under attack. When, when a society <laughs> becomes more authoritarian, uh, that's the first thing you lose, the ability to, <coughs> to laugh at yourself, yeah. at your own history, at your own identity. Again, I mean, it's a small example from England, but there's this... A program called Horrible Histories. It's for children, <laughs> and you know, you make fun of your own history, your kings and your queens. To me, coming from Turkey, it was just un unthinkable. I can't think of a Turkish program making fun of an Ottoman sultan. You, you would be really put on trial. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm reading this interview. Hilary Mantel talks about the, the ro royals in a critical way, yes, language. Yes. Again, I'm thinking, wow, she's going to be put on trial. Martin Amis gives a very critical interview about what's happening in England again. Whereas in Turkey, the moment a novelist does that or an artist dares to have such a program, immediately the people think you're insulting our history. Right. That, how come? Why that insecurity? I mean, that's the irony of nationalism. It's so robust, so aggressive, and at the same time so insecure. Right. The dichotomy between fiction and nonfiction. I always just feel if time is a critical issue, I defer to the nonfiction because good writing can be found there as well. And then it's wonderful to be able to go into the area of fiction as well. But there's so much that we need to know and there's just not enough time to get all of that information in. That's point one. Number two, with regard to Poland, would one think that maybe they should be given a break because of the traumas they've experienced with partitioning? I mean, it's yes. not to excuse. Of no, of course not. Of course and the not. third of thing is, yeah. uh, in your heart of hearts <laughs> and in the deepest gut, would you imagine yourself fantasizing that there is a Kurdistan? I mean, how does that issue dwell inside you? Because to many Americans and who are, uh, I would say, objective, we all feel that the Kurds have been denied their most basic legitimate right. Three big questions. Oh yeah. Well, the, I, I'll just take one of the the fiction nonfiction thing. You know, it's interesting because I once asked someone who who said something similar after doing a radio interview with me, and he said, you know, I don't 
read fiction, but my wife does. He said that thing. And then I said, well, when you say that to me, are you saying that Homer and Dante and Shakespeare and Milton uh, 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 and Cervantes are unimportant. And he looked at me shocked, and I realized he wasn't saying that those, you know, canonized great writers aren't important. He was talking, I think, about what he thought of as women's fiction. Um, if I hadn't read a lot of those canonized writers, by the way, I really think that I would have a different mind. I also read a lot of science, a lot of philosophy, and all of that has created for me um, a tremendous, uh, what I think of as an agility of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I gave uh, neurology grand rounds at Harvard and Mass General in January. And one of the things I said to researchers, scientists working on Alzheimer's and and uh, dementia research. I said, the reason I think you should read literature and philosophy and the social sciences, as well as science, you know, neuroscience, is because it will help you solve problems in your own work. Because they're worrying about models, they're worrying about all this, it helps you. It gives you a flexibility of mind that you don't have if you're only reading one thing. That's sort of my, this is like a passionate statement of belief. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you can take Kurdistan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the toughest I question. Know, I, can't, I can't do that at all, so please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to take that question as well, but to, to begin with the first one, uh, again, one of the many things we have in common is our love also for nonfiction. Yeah, you know, we yeah. love reading nonfiction and very different disciplines, but that's the beauty of it. I think the mind is curious and doesn't stop, and why should we stop? What is artificial is to draw boundaries and then to say, okay, this is fiction, it's not my area, I'm not going in, in there. Why, why do we do that? If it speaks to our minds, if it speaks to our hearts, why not keep reading? I like that kind of interdisciplinary conversation. Uh, and I think knowledge at the end of the day is a circle. You know, why are we taking slices out of it? What we learn in one area helps us in another area, helps us our emotional intelligence uh, in another area without us noticing it. But I think it's important to remember that knowledge is a big, big circle rather than thinking of it as compartmentalized and divided by, by walls, uh, which are, in my opinion is not helping. In, in, in academia, it's not helping either. No. With regards to Poland, you are very right. Of course, history is important. Traumas are important. But that's the point. Those traumas are being exploited by populist demagogues all the time. I mean, I see that in Turkey as well. Uh, yeah. and, and especially countries that have had painful pasts um, you, it's easy to gloss that over and to build yes, this narrative yeah. of a golden age. Why don't we go back to the golden age? It's either a glorious future or a golden age. Nobody just focuses on the present, you know? <laughs> There's no mindfulness right, in, the, yeah. in the politics of populism. It's, it's it always moving in those two directions. So all I'm saying is these are universal traits that we see in country after country, and I think we need to be careful about this. So I wasn't criticizing Poland at all. I'm criticizing populist tendencies that I see across the board. Um, with regards to Kurdistan, really it's a difficult question. Why? I'll tell you, because my primary instinct is, I, as you might have noticed, I'm very critical of nationalism, tribalism, isolationism, <coughs> religious fanaticism. These are things that I've criticized all my life. On the other hand, I respect people's right to, to assert their um, ethnic identity, their differences. Uh, to me, it's a big problem when we say in Turkey that everybody is Turkish, not necessarily. I mean, we are the grandchildren of a multi-ethnic, multilingual Ottoman Empire, right? How can we all be the same? So one of the biggest mistakes, in my opinion, uh, was to claim that we were all a monolithic mass yeah. and we were all Turks. You know, as long as you say you're a Turk, you're a Turk. 
if, if you're a Kurd, if you're Armenian, if you're a Jew, if you're a Greek, why can't you say this? Why is diversity seen as a problem? Again, it's a small example, mm. but I remember years ago when I was much younger, coming to Hay Festival for the first time in England, and I just stopped looking at these road signs because they were written in two languages, English and Welsh. Yeah. I've never seen a road sign in Turkey written in Turkish and Kurdish. And yeah. then you ask yourself, why not? Why can't have people a right to education in their mother tongue? Yeah. Why are they treated as secondary citizens? So these things are wrong. But of course, what I want in my heart is coexistence, you know, rather than separation. But um, that's not up to me to, to decide. Siri, I know you have written about the importance of, or the equality of a scientific education and being educated in the science as well as in the humanity and the arts. So I, I was wondering how you felt about, I feel in my generation, a great push for young people to get into STEM careers and learn yeah. Go into scientific fields, enter a big push for vocational education. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. both of which seem to forego education in the humanities. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to know. Yeah, so probably that. at this moment in American culture, uh, the humanities are the, the disciplines that need more defense. Um, I gave a lecture in Germany about Geisteswissenschaft, which is. Um, uh, the sort of hu sciences of the humanities, including the social sciences, opposed to what was called Naturwissenschaft, or uh, natural sciences. And um, I cited a conference that was, why do we need the science, why do we need the humanities? Cognitive science gives us the answer. <laughs> it was a real conference, I'm not kidding. And I thought, you know, with that, with the opposite, you know, why do we need the hard sciences? The humanities tell us why? I mean, no. So, so there is a, a certain bias. And when I talk to scientists, I make a, a point of talking about models. How do we model? Scientists need models. You need a model in order to create an experiment. You need all of this. And some of those models are pretty shaky. And it helps to have a background in philosophy and literature, too, in order to understand how those models are working and on what those paradigms are, are resting upon. Uh, when I talk to people in the humanities, I'm often trying to do the opposite. I'm explaining to them how reductive models, the reductive models used, you, that are used in science, can help address particular problems in the humanities, too. That data is not something you just have contempt for, right? That, that, so bringing, this is where we're very similar, bringing these um, uh, two oppositional forces in the culture mm -hmm. into forms of rich, not impoverished dialogue is something I really believe in. And mm -hmm. you're right, um, at the moment, um, arguments for the humanities are needed, and I think they can be, be made very strongly in, in terms of the sciences, that um, if you don't understand the ground of your work, and if you don't have a historical perspective on the science that you're doing, you're often in trouble. You run, in, you run into dead ends that could be easily avoided. Mm -hmm. no. Ella, did you want to add no, anything to that? Full, full agreement. <laughs> in that case, we bid all of you good night and hope to see you upstairs. Please join me in thanking Thank Siri Hisbet and Ella Chafak.